detail, so forgive me if uh, it might sometimes be a little difficult to understand. We're trying to close the crystalloid colloid debate, and uh, I'm going to make the case that it's all over and done with. Uh, bar the shouting, the fat lady's got to come and sing. My message to you is going to be keep calm and just say no to colloid osmotic pressure support. So I've changed it a little bit. I'm not saying colloids, I'm saying colloid osmotic pressure support. If you've got a colloid that's got something that does something more specifically biological, for all, fine, go ahead. And um, I'm going to take you historically back to 1675 when uh, Charles II of England, it is of England, not of Scotland, Charles II of England set up a thing called the Royal Society in London and invited all the best scientists to come along and try to deliver the art. And one of the early medical lectures uh, was from a chap called William Hunter who uh, said, I think I have proved that the lymphatic vessels are the absorbing vessels all over the body. These, together with the thoracic duct, are dispersed throughout the body for absorption. And that is as true today as it was 350 years ago. So if you look at the panel on the right, you can see a, a, a diagram from a standard textbook explaining to you how three liters of plasma uh, produces eight liters of ultrafiltrate a day, uh, which enters afferent uh, vessel, lymphatic vessels around about half of that eight liters is reabsorbed back into lymphatic capillaries, and the remaining four liters goes on in the efferent lymphatics to places like the uh, thoracic duct, where it's returned to the circulation. And in the bottom panel there, we've got a nice picture of a, a collecting lymphatic in an edematous patient, and we've got a cartoon diagram explaining how the lymphatic circulation is powered. 1896, Starling made his uh, observations that uh, the absorption of isotonic salt solution, he injected isotonic salt solution into the muscle of an anesthetized dog, uh, is determined by the osmotic pressure of the serum proteids. He was right. It was the oncotic pressure of the serum proteids that drew that injection of normal saline back into the blood vessels. And he observed that if you injected an albumin solution, it did not get reabsorbed. Uh, but he did say he does not know that that accounts for the absorption of dropsical fluid. Dropsical fluid is edema tissue fluid in 1896 speak. And when the Great War came, they looked for colloids to give to patients with wound shock. And the first one that they found was gum from the acacia tree. And they gave soldiers gum saline here in Belgium. So Belgium is the site of the, some of the first colloid administration by the British Expeditionary Force. And the blood pressure went up. Why did the blood pressure go up? They found out 20 years later, it's because they were dissolving the, the gum in London tap water. What's London tap water got? Calcium. So these soldiers were all getting a, a bolus of calcium that accounted for their blood pressure going up, not the colloid. In the, uh, when America was considering uh, joining in the, the, the Second War, they charged uh, a chap called Cohn with, with giving them buckets and buckets and buckets of albumin, uh, and he did. And the history books record that albumin exhibited remarkable effects when administered to injured persons as an antidote to shock. Well, we all, of course, know now that that's just not true. It might have been his perspective, but we know that there was nothing in it. It's back in the 80s that these remarkable chaps, uh, Frank Curry and Charles Michel, and they were much, they're much younger than they are now, uh, were talking about the fact that fluid leaves the circulation through a molecular sieve of some description, and they hadn't found out what it was, um, and that the fluid th flows through a matrix of molecular fibers which cover the endothelial cells and fills the channels between them. We now talk about the glycocalyx. But even in those days, they realized that you can have sustained filtration across the matrix. Fluid can leave the circulation, but fluid cannot return. It is not possible for there to be sustained reabsorption of filtered fluid. And in uh, 2004, they eventually got together in a big group, did the definitive experiment in a laboratory in California. Sheldon Weinbaum's actually from New York. Roger Adamson is the laboratory guy. We hypothesize that ultrafiltrate crossing the luminal endothelial glycocalyx through infrequent discontinuities in the tight junction strand of the endothelial clefts reduces albumin diffusive flux from the tissue 
uh, into the protected region. The protected region is that space just under the glycocalyx layer where because it's a good filter, there is essentially no albumin, no proteins, no colloids under that space. Um, and uh, that was what they found, uh, that in fact that was true. So what we know now, you're used to seeing cartoons of capillaries that filter at the um, arterial end and then ab absorb at the venous end. That had never been seen. Landis and Pappenheimer had said that happens, but it had never been seen. And actually, even they said, we're actually guessing, we don't know this is true. But it went into every physiology book and it stayed in every physiology book. So what we know now is that well-perfused capillaries filter fluid along their entire length. We know that if you suddenly make your subject hypovolemic to reduce the capillary pressure by making them hypokalemic or giving them a bolus of noradrenaline, did you know that noradrenaline reduces your capillary pressure? Uh, then you will get a transient absorption of fluid. How about that? Noradrenaline gives you 500 mils extra fluid into your bloodstream if you start it quickly. Um, but that effect only lasts for a maximum of 30 minutes, actually more usually 20 minutes, and it's 500 mils in a big lad is absolutely the maximum that you're going to get. After which it reverts to steady state, which is why we now call it the steady state Starling principle, and however low the capillary pressure is, you just have a minimal amount of filtration. And this is the principle that I try to explain to anaesthetists through my British Journal of Anesthesia article in 2012. Please read it. Um, everyone who's read it comes to me and says, I've read it two, three, four times, and I'm still not sure I understand it. I apologize. It is difficult because it's presenting a wholly new concept to you and, and turning, up, turning the apple cart on your beliefs of Starling physiology. And the no absorption rule explains why the colloid osmotic properties of plasma or plasma substitutes add little to volume resuscitation while the transendothelial pressure difference, delta P, is below the J point. Below the J point, and that's, the J point is a capillary pressure of around about 20, any fluid that you put in will stay in the circulation. How often have you heard it said colloids stay in the circulation? Well, so do crystalloids when your capillary pressure is too low to filter fluid out. It's, it's basic physics. Nothing leaves the circulation when the capillary pressure is too low. Normal saline will stay in, Hartmann's will stay in, any colloid you care to mention will stay in. I dare say even 5% dextrose will stay in, but I don't recommend that because your brain will swell and that will kill you. And these are some cartoons that I made for the British Journal of Anesthesia, and, and so they are elementary, showing endothelial cell with a reasonably full um, glycocalyx on the left and with a shrunken glycocalyx on the right. I don't know what to call that process. Some people say the glycocalyx breaks down. The truth is it changes its volume all the time, and we don't know whether it's breaking down or just physiologically shrinking and expanding. I don't have a word for that. But it's a diagram explaining how if the glycocalyx shrinks, the red cells have got a little bit more volume to rattle around in, and when you draw a blood, your patient looks more anemic. If you want to know what that intravascular volume is, you can do a dextran 40 dilution volume, which will show you roughly the whole intravascular volume that your crystalloid is going into. Uh, dextran 70, bigger molecule, doesn't enter the glycocalyx so well, uh, and that um, distribution volume will be, is roughly the free-flowing plasma. Uh, but when you look at red cell dilution, you're not, looking at the, you're not even looking at the free-flowing plasma uh, because the red cells are kept away from the edge of the capillaries and the, uh, the arteries and the veins. Uh, and so the red cell distribution volume is, a much more in, is a, a, an even smaller volume. Uh, and with respect to Professor Hahn, who's going to follow, a lot of my work is based on the work of Professor Hahn. I have the greatest respect for it. But I have to say that red cell dilution studies are unreliable as an index of acute blood volume change. And so what we find is that in volunteers and in anesthetized patients, the volume effect ratio of crystalloid to colloid for causing anemia and hypoalbuminemia is about 5 to 1. If you want to make someone anemic, if you want to make them hypoalbuminemic, colloids are superb. Crystalloids can't touch it. Crystalloids do not make you anemic. Crystalloids do not make you hypoalbuminemic. Uh, but in septic patients and in general ICU patients and in goal-directed therapy patients, if you're looking at the volume ratio for the correction of, of, uh, for resuscitation, then consistently that ratio is about 1.5 to 1. 
The only person I've heard make that point so far was someone from the audience who pointed out for all the talk about, you know, three to ones for colloids and crystalloids, it's actually 1.3 to 1, 1.5 to 1. What we really need to be talking about is this sort of stuff. Um, and we, we have started talking about the glycocalyx now, which I welcome, but actually we need to talk about more than the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is just one part of the filtration units for the capillary. And it, we can't just treat it on its own. Um, and the filtration unit is responding as you are sitting there minute by minute. Your capillary permeability is going up and down in order to man manipulate your blood volume or whatever else it is your body is trying to do. You need a, reg a decent supply of red cells. We're all agreed with that. The red cells bring sphingosin 1 phosphate. Fine. They need albumin. The sphingosin 1 phosphate is carried by albumin to the capillary wall. So you could argue we need some albumin. Um, and you need in the cell a good supply of cyclic AMP. And what that does is to allow what they call small GTPase enzymes called RAC1 and RAP1 to continuously repair, rebuild the adherens junction between the cells, the tight junction strands between the cells, and the balance of synthesis and degradation of the glycocalyx. So that supply of sphingosin from red cells via albumin to the, to the endothelium uh, is, produces a mechanism which maintains the whole unit and not just the glycocalyx. And um, we know that if we fill the patient up with sphingosin before an inflammatory insult so that we can block the capillary leak that follows the insult. But more happily than that, if we insult the endothelium and make it leaky, it does respond uh, to uh, a, 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 res a res restoring dose of sphingosin 1-phosphate and intracellular cyclic AMP, which re-establishes the adherens junction uh, modulates the tight junctions and the glycocalyx in that order. Sphingosin 1-phosphate is a potent angiogenic factor that enhances lung endothelial cell integrity and an inhibitor of vascular permeability and alveolar flooding in preclinical animal models. So in future mod meetings, I hope we'll be talking about how we can start manipulating capillary permeability for the benefit of our patients. Having a colloid crystalloid debate is not going to do that. So here's uh, my, my farewell message. I sat next to a charming gentleman from South Africa who uh, wanted to thank me because he'd gone into his exam, had been asked about the Starling equation, had told them about the revised Starling equation. The examiners said, we've never heard of that, but they passed him with flying colors. And the final little bit is uh, Luciano Gattinoni has been going around with lots of pearls at this meeting. And so here's one that he gave us that I can't justify, but talk to Luciano. He said, in the absence of a colloid osmotic pressure gradient between plasma and tissues, how, small, how do you think the, the plasma volume would shrink? Would it be a liter? Would the plasma volume collapse if there was no colloid osmotic pressure gradient? And he said the, the, pre, the volume difference would be about 150 mils. Now, I, as I say, I can't scientifically back that up, but Luciano's been going around this meeting this weekend saying that to several people, and whenever he gets the chance, it's clearly enthused him. So there you are. I leave you with the message that, uh, please, let's put an end to the colloid-crystalloid debate. Just say no to colloid osmotic pressure support. Thank you very much.